here at the Pacific Northwest District Championship with Team 2046 Bear Metal from Maple Valley, Washington. I'm here with Matthew, Strady, Zach, and Asher. And we're going to start off by talking about uh, the design of their um, amazing robot. Uh, they're currently one of the top ranked teams here at uh, the Pacific Northwest District Championship. Um, and surely they're here to, they're surely going to show off their ability this weekend. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineer their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more and apply. Support funds content creators when you sign up for a membership on YouTube Join. You'll get access to special perks like emotes, loyalty badges, and fund members will even get early access to our scheduled videos and more. 100% of this revenue will go back to our correspondents to help recognize their efforts. Click the join button in any YouTube video to pledge your support. All right, let's start off with Matthew. Awesome. Uh, my name is Matthew. I'm one of the design leads for Bare Metal. Um, I'm going to talk about some of our design system processes. So for this year, we wanted to kind of um, kind of revise what our systems behind our design reviews are going to look like for the for this build season. Um, one primary primary change we wanted to add was our uh, SDR review, otherwise known as our system design review, which allows us to evaluate the success of a certain architecture in competition. So going into our first few days of kickoff, we conceptualize what sort of mechanical methods as well as what strategic benefits that we want to take advantage of um, in competition. And following three days off the of kickoff, we start our SDR review, which culminates in both 2D geometry and 3D geometry. Um, as represented with our Crayola CAD inspired off of 254's Crayola CAD, um, which allows us to evaluate in both a 2D space how a search mechanism is going to integrate as with other mechanisms as well as how it's going to interact with the field, and for our 3D geometry to understand how our packaging is going to work for this year. And following off of that SDR review, we kind of evaluate what architectures we wanted to approach um, and kind of further our knowledge on, and we decide through this pat we'll be passing it as the pass-through handoff. Um, as it's named in CAD, um, essentially what we ended up with by the end of it. Uh, following that SDR review, we would proceed with design, um, developing our AlphaBot CAD, which enabled us to essentially early on prototype, um, well not even prototype, but have a high fidelity prototype um, within the first two weeks of build season to understand how these, in, these systems processes and as well as our integration for our robots going to go. And by the end of week two, early into week three, we were able to develop a full alphabot, which um, in CAD as well as fully assembled, uh, uh, wired and fabricated, which essentially gave our programming team um, extra step up in terms of when they got a robot, which can actually start to establish our code base. Um, so yeah, in both these two processes, both our SCR as well as our alphabot, we were able to quickly develop a robot that we can understand whether it's going to be advantageous in the game as well as kind of understand what kind of difficulties are we going to encounter with our competition robot. Um, and that kind of just leads us into what we came up with um, following those uh, first three weeks. We started um, finishing up our final CAD and developing our robot and this is what we ended up with. Um, so first in, we have our collector here. It's a simple drop down. Yeah. Simple drop down collector, which uh, has four rollers here, two pinching, which pack pick, uh, has um, a touch, touch it only uh, mentality where as soon as you feed a note in, go straight, straight into our index rollers for our shooter. Um, as you can see, four rollers here, and they're all dead axled and uh, essentially tethered through a dead axle here as well. Um, which feeds directly into our shooter. If we can drop down the shooter and show the shoot, uh, sorry, drop down the collector and show the shooter. We can see here our, our design for our shooter is based off of essentially having one index, well, one index, two index, two index for rollers which are tied to a motor and essentially holds our game piece during the match, which then feeds it into our flywheels here. One side has a four, uh, on our right side we have four inch stealth wheels, on the other side we have three and a half stealth wheels. Uh, sorry, Colson wheels, and what those do essentially as we feed in our note into these flywheels, they shoot out, right? And the reason behind using three, inch, uh, three and a half and four inch wheels is so that we can induce 
spin into our no, which actually through prototyping and through our, again, our alpha bot allowed us to iterate and find that this shooter was gonna be the most optimal for our design um, in terms of packaging as well as like pretty good shot performance and accuracy. Um, again, these two are, they're not actually Diffy shooter. I know that's one of the, one of the more popular designs in FRC right now. We continue to use just um, essentially just standard two axles driven with two motors. Um, and we found a lot of success with that. I want to mention the topic bottom links. Yeah, sure. We, um, actually, on our new iteration of our shooter, uh, we started tethering these two two bottom, top and bottom axles, which allows us to essentially verify, well, mechanically tie those two motors together. Uh, because before we would actually have one motor drive the bottom roller or bottom flywheels, one motor drive the top flywheel. And we suspected that just a slight difference in those two top speeds might induce top and bottom variation in our, our note trajectory. So from there, um, we decided to tie them mechanically. So, and that kind of leads us into our amp pass off. So yeah, I'll be talking about the amp arm. Uh, my name is Brady Hogue. I am the bare metal president and former CAD lead. So if you want to go ahead, um, the whole idea behind the amp arm is we wanted something that we could score into the amp as well as the trap with. And when we score into the amp, we want to make sure that our bumpers are touching the wood. That way we can just get squared in a way and we don't have to try and float there and sort of gently come in. So as he just showed very quickly, uh, if you want to spit that out and go back to Stowe. So the position starts with uh, all the rollers aligned. And then if you want to feed another note through, the amp arm will quickly um, rotate 180 degrees to feed the note through the two rollers. And then it comes right up into the scoring position for us to score down to the amp. Uh, to touch more uh, physically what this is, it's two 500X axles covered in a surgical rubber. Um, and with that, we are able to get a really strong compression. Um, and the note really only comes out when it, um, the, it, it's driven. It's very rigid. Um, the actual design of the amp arm is we have one motor that drives the wrist position and we wanted to make sure that we're not driving it on one side. So in our gearbox, we have a uh, axle that on the first stage of the gearbox that runs all the way along the bottom. That way the left and right are mechanically linked. So we're not getting any skew as we come up. Um, and so that gets driven through these two uh, number 35 chains um, through this sprocket here to get our rotation. Can we hit the main breaker please just so I can? Thank you. So that allows this uh, movement right here. And then for the uh, wrist itself, it's driven um, on either side. And so this side right here is the rotation of the wrist and that's done through two belts going through the tube. So one belt there, one belt through there. And this belt, or sorry, this um, pulley right here is a billet piece that is connected to the amp arm through a counterbore of the exact geometry. I believe we have a spare if we could show that. Um, so it comes into there, and so we're getting uh, torque transformation not through the axle, but through the plate. And so just like this. And what that enables us to do is we can use this axle as what we call a zombie axle. So it's both live and dead. It's um, live on this side because it's able to, or I guess it's a dead axle on this side because it's able to rotate around itself. But then on this side, it drives straight through the axle. So same belt as the, as the other side, except that's what powers the rotation in this case. Um, and then a couple extra things is we, we, the reason we wanted to do this is so that we could have the lowest amount of inertia possible for our amp arm. That way our pit loop can be very tight. Um, and then we also added this yellow bar across the front. Um, this is really just to strengthen up this, this whole system and to make it more rigid. Um, also it helps us, helps the driver see which orientation it is in case there's an issue. Um, so like I said, this scores in the amp as well as the trap. These are our two shootouts right here. And so at our bottom most position, um, if we didn't have anything bracing against the bottom, we would simply backflip. So to prevent that, we have two um, tubes on constant four springs that are tied to these climbers so that when these climbers come up, a latch releases and they both shoot out automatically. Um, and these, both of these climbers are independently driven on a belted gearbox. Um, and so as they come up, the chain falls into these little hooks right there and we make sure that the chain is in by basically pushing it back down and forcing the chain to be in this position um, from which point both of the uh, climber arms or the climber towers come down as this guy comes up and scores us in the trap.
One thing we also knew is that with our architecture, the wiring and packaging was going to be a nightmare. However, we were able to cleverly come around that by doing underside wiring, and we have Asher to talk about that. Okay, yeah. So the main thing with the undersided wiring, and this connects also with how we, the reason we did the amp arm, which having all the motors really low down, is so that down here, we could have each of the wires go down through the swerve um, wells on each corner, right? And then go through a routing system that was designed by me and an, another designer to um, route them to the PDH, which is located right here, and to the Rio, which is right here. So just a quick tracing of how, and we just preface this, we daisy chain all our CAN systems off of, we do a um, canivore for the drive system to make sure that if anything happens to the Rio, then, then the canivore is still running, and also to make sure that the um, can, that system is the fastest, the most reliable. And then off of the Rio is where all the like shooter and amp arm stuff comes from. So here are the schematics. Um, you can follow along. This is a sketch we made in Inventor right here that shows um, where each of the wires were designed to go. So if you follow along, you can see over here is where it starts from the um, canivore, or actually, I believe this is canivore, and it chains from here up to the uh, encoder, loops around, comes down here. Actually, it chains up through to the pigeon right here and loops back around down here. So that's the main like drive system can. And then for the um, can up top, we have it um, get, stay within each subsystem uh, on either side. So the uh, gearboxes for one side uh, of the amp arm are chained together. And then that goes to the climber gearbox, which is then chained to the collectors and so on and so forth, right? Let me see if I can, and adding on to that, here's our electrical schematics, which we lay out um, during the design season to try and get, make sure um, we know where everything's being plugged in, make sure we have all the things in the best ports to lower resistance. So you can see here, this is the PDH. We planned out beforehand to have all four drive motors be laid out in the first four ports to lower the resistance. So you can see that right here, they're labeled. Back right drive, front right drive, back left drive, and back, uh, front left drive. That was just to make sure that we don't brown out as much by drawing as much current. And then we also did, if I go along to here, is we planned out. This was planned out near the beginning of the season, or around the beginning of the season. Once we had an initial, like, during the Crayola CAD setup and also during main design season, where each of the CAN systems would go to and where it would end so that anytime we have any failures, we can um, diagnose it very easily by unplugging things and figuring out where it is. And then another thing that we did were these 3D printed um, trusses that were designed. We did those for the purpose of like making sure you can see each of the wires and that they're organized. And we, we also did that so that they can be as short as possible when going to the PDH. And then, um, one other thing to of note to say, you can set it down, is for each of our batteries, we decided to go to SB120 connectors and two gauge wire so that we can just get a little bit less resistance there and have more sturdy connections. And that makes it so that we can brown out less and have less battery issues. And um, we noticed with just through like some of our code sensing and stuff, we've been having those in previous years. And so along with all those different electrical things we added to reduce brownouts, we also did lots of code things like current limits and other stuff. So I hand you off to the code lead. Yeah, my name's Zach and I'm uh, one of the lead programmers here at Bare Metal. Um, we code in Java primarily. Um, and this year we have switched to the Kraken motors, which are really nice. We, we like them a lot. Um, just stuff about our code. Uh, this is our first year using Advantage Kit. It has been probably the greatest thing ever. Um, that's like what we go to like every single match to diagnose what went wrong. Um, uh, all of the all of the controls on the mechanisms are done through motion profiles through the Phoenix 6 uh, motion magic. Um, first time using that as well has been a great help. Um, we have like 2000 like we have 2000 less lines of code than we did last year due to the new motors. And so that's been a really big help. Um, another thing we have switched to new this year is the orange pies. So all of our, all of our other electronic components are mounted inside these gussets here. 
including our cameras. So we have we have two shooter facing cameras and we have one on this side. Um, those are all doing uh, April tags localization uh, throughout the entire match. So our code uses our odometry or our, our, or our field pose to know where we are at any time on the match. And then we use that for autos, we use that for shooting, we use that for trap. And for the trap, it's completely autonomous. Um, we are using the path, uh, path planner library's uh, pathfinding to pathfind to the right spot to put up the amp arm and the hooks, and then we drive in. All right. Uh, thank you, 2046 Bare Metal, uh, for your phenomenal robot this year. Um, every year you're coming out with bright machines. Uh, good luck uh, at this event and uh, for the future. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineered their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to Kettering.edu first to learn more and apply.